morning in Iola, and I, I try to uh, remember. A lot of times I forget and have whatever special we do in Iola, do it here as well. And I usually try not to do solos because uh, it just kind of opens up a, a can of worms there. But, um, but man, that song is just, it's just a wonderful song. It, it really convicted me this morning as I was listening to it. I was thinking just about David you know, saying, search me, O God. And in fact, there's a verse where he, more than one verse where he says, judge me, right? And in a world where everyone says, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Can you imagine asking God who knows every bit, he knows your heart, he knows your thoughts and saying, judge me, God. I mean, you're thinking David made some pretty big mistakes in his past. And so obviously he's, he's not going to hold those old ones over David's head because those are forgiven. And so praise the Lord that we can go to him uh, you know, confess our, our, our faults, confess our sins, get those right, be repentant of it, and then say, okay, now I'm going to live forward. And I'm going to say, God, if there's anything else I need to get right, you know, search me, reveal that to me, and help me uh, to get that right. And so, uh, you know, I think it's good to reflect on those things. And it went really well with the message this morning because uh, the message this morning was on the forgiveness of Christ. And he's uh, he forgives. We're there in uh, Luke 20. Three, and so he's talking about, you know, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do and everything. And, and boy, what a forgiving and merciful God, and we're thankful for that. This afternoon, I want to talk about uh, the subject of reflecting on his suffering, reflecting on the suffering of Christ. And in mainstream Christianity, this pretty much is Christianity in a nutshell reflecting on the suffering of Christ. And that might sound like a really good thing. That might sound like, uh, oh, that is not what we're supposed to do. You know, but I'm going to show kind of a little bit of a different thought here this morning. Uh, when we think about reflecting on the suffering, a lot of times what we think in today's modern society, especially uh, from a mainstream Christian point of view, is this weeping and mourning about the suffering of Christ. And and just the other day in Iola, we were not, we knocked we we've been hitting a small town there, Carlisle, and we've got it knocked out this last Saturday. But a couple Saturdays ago, I knocked on the door, and man, we were having a hard time. I met a uh, uh, Wiccan and a and a agnostic, and a lady that said uh, she's atheist, but maybe more agnostic. And I'm thinking, what's going on with Carlisle? And then the last Saturday we went, wasn't a whole whole lot better either. It wasn't super receptive. But I met this one guy there who would have convinced me, would have convinced probably the majority of Christians that he was a saved man. I think he was Church of Christ Holiness, something like that. And, uh, and the more you listen to him, the more you begin to realize that he was teaching a works-based salvation. He believed in uh, you know works, basically, when it comes down to you had to do the works. Uh, if you didn't do those works, then you weren't saved. But, but when I began talking to him, and he began talking about the Lord, you know, there was one point where he started talking about the suffering of Jesus and tears began to flow down his eyes. And he began to talk about, you know, what my Lord did for me. You know, and he began to describe things that weren't necessarily even in the Bible, but you've heard stories or you've watched movies or whatever, and you've seen those things and the cat of nine tails and how it had glass and bones and whatever hooked to it. And, 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 and whenever they beat Jesus and, and, and pulled it back. It would rip off his flesh. I don't know if he, they used a cat of nine tails or what. I've been taught that myself. But the thing is, all these things he was saying was just pictures that he had in his head and things that he had watched. I've never seen this, but the, uh, uh, the Passion of Christ, real popular. A lot of people probably this time of year, especially watching the Passion of the Christ. And you know, uh, uh, Mel Gibson, I know that he got some of the, he directed that. I don't know I was going to, I guess there's a certain amount of writing, scripting that has to be done and that. I don't know what, if he had a part in that, but I heard that he got, they got a lot of their, um, their, the pictures and the, the sequences that happen in that film from a Catholic prophetess. Some lady had some visions and said, Hey, this is what happened. You know, the thief on the cross, when he died, this raven landed on his shoulder and plucked out his eyeball or something like that. Where's where that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, but some lady had a vision, makes good Hollywood film. And so people have these visions in their head. They have the, the suffering. They have, uh, you know, apparently in that movie, this is probably true. 
you know, whenever I read the description of Jesus in the Bible, but in that movie, so bloody, I guess, that you can't even make out his face or anything like that. And a lot of people just think that is Christianity, to think about Jesus suffering, think about him on the cross, and maybe weep about that, mourn about that. How many times have you heard preachers get up and, and have you ever heard the kind of crying preaching and it's like the whole time they're just weeping and, and hey, there's some, there are a lot of people that think, oh, that's true Christianity. He's crying. He's emotional. You know, he's just, he's thinking about the Lord and he's just, you know, and I'm not saying always an emotional person is, is, is wrong. Some people are more emotional than others. But praise the Lord, our salvation has nothing to do with our emotions, right? If you never cried when you got saved, that doesn't mean you're not saved. <laughs> if you didn't uh, just like change everything, and, and, and if you're a guy, got a haircut, and, and got the earrings out, and got all this stuff. and check. Now, sometimes that happens, but if that didn't happen to you, it doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay? Uh, it, it, this is people, as people emphasize the emotional part and the uh, sensationalism uh, of religion. And so this is why a lot of people would rather have the spiritist, you know, outside of the Bible. Hey, I've seen experiences. I've seen healings. I've seen all this kind of stuff. And people want to focus on those types of things instead of just reading the Bible and saying, you know, we're going to read what happened. We're going to believe that. We're going to do what the Bible tells us to do. They want to make it more than that. But if you look at Luke chapter 23, Last week in Iola, I preached from this text here, and this jumped out at me, verse 28. Luke chapter 23, verse 28. Let's start in verse 27. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. This is Jesus heading towards the cross, okay? Uh, uh, Simon's carrying the cross. Uh, Jesus is, is I don't know if he's tied up, chained up, whatever, but he's out ahead, and then Simon is behind him carrying the cross. And it says that these ladies are following him, bewailing, lamenting him, verse 28. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say, to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall they do in the dry? And now you read that, line that up with Revelation 5 and Matthew 24, and you kind of know what he's talking about. Hey, the days are coming, you know, the end times, if you will, and the, and the, the end of Christianity whenever you're being persecuted and all, and uh, there's a lot we can, we can draw from that. He says, weep for yourself. You know, you've got a job to do. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but uh, I just I want you to notice that when he was being crucified, he was headed towards the, 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 the Calvary there, the place of the skull. He said, hey, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. Look at chapter 24. Luke 24, after the resurrection. After the resurrection, Jesus begins to talk to two of the disciples that are on the road to Emmaus. And uh, they're sad. Okay, look at these, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked, themse uh, they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, uh, whose name was Cleopas, answered, uh, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known uh, the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, uh, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it hath been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since uh, these things were done. Yea, a certain woman also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying uh, that they had also seen a vision of angels, which uh, said, 
that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, this is Jesus talking now, he says, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to just hear it from Jesus himself, all the scripture expounded unto him. Praise the Lord, he did that. And then the apostles were able to teach the early church. They were able to write down the scripture as God inspired them to do. And they were able to teach people what Jesus said. But Jesus called them fool because they were sad. And they're sitting there dwelling on the fact that this Jesus, whom was supposed to lead the nation of Israel and what have you, and instead they crucified him and they're sad. And Jesus says, oh, thou fool. Now, we do preach the cross, right? I'm not against preaching the cross. We've got a cross and Iola right behind me while I'm preaching in the baptistry. doesn't have Jesus on it. It's not a crucifix because Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. <laughs> okay. But there's a cross up there. And, and, and you know, we talk about the cross and we say, hide me behind the cross. And, and we, we, we often talk about the cross. And that is kind of like the symbol of Christianity. I mean, everybody thinks about the cross. And it's true. We preach the cross. But what does that mean that we preach the cross? Let's look at a couple of verses. Look at Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath day reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. Now, it's funny. Jesus was telling the disciples the whole, his whole ministry that he must go to the cross. He didn't say cross, but he said, I must suffer. I must be uh, delivered unto them and, and suffer many things. And they kept resisting that and resisting that. And then after he died and then he rose again and he, he's telling them, hey, this is what was supposed to happen. Went through the prophets and talked to them about it. Well, here, uh, th this is uh, uh, Paul talking in to the Jews in the synagogues. And he's saying, you know, Christ must have suffered. What did he do? He went to the, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, just like Jesus did to the, uh, to those disciples there. And he said, <clears throat> and, and uh, he must have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So the thing is, he didn't just preach the suffering of Jesus. He didn't build up this whole big thing about the suffering and all that stuff. He preached what we would call the gospel, right? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the hope. You know, that's the, uh, the important part of the, uh, of the whole thing. Look at uh, Acts, no, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And look at verse 34. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that, co that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is ever at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. To just sit there and dwell only on the suffering of Christ and to think about his beating and to think about all that and to make a big deal about that is incomplete right? We know that he had to do that. He did that for a reason. And I was talking about this morning how that was, the, that was one of the main reasons he's able to forgive everybody who's doing the things that they're doing. Look, look, he had every power. He had the authority. He could have come down off that cross if he wanted to. You know, when those guys that, that were smiting him and uh, putting the crown of thorns on him and doing all the things they did, right before he died, he could have been like, you know what? I just want to see these guys get what, you know, they have coming to them. And he could have, you know, done whatever he wanted to do, but he forgave them. Well, why did he forgive them? Well, because this is what he was destined to do. This is what he was supposed to do. You know, this is what Isaiah said, you know, by his stripes we are healed. And this is what all the prophets were saying was supposed to happen. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He had a job to do. He had to suffer. He had to die. He had to be buried. He had to rise again. This was all part of the plan. And so... Uh, I, the, the Bible says about the resurrection, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, uh, and your faith is also in vain. We preach the resurrection, you know, because the fact that, that, that this is where we get our hope, and this is what our faith is, the fact that he had power over death, and that he proved himself to, uh, uh, to be uh, the, the promised one. Okay, now 
let's be honest, it would be weird if we had no emotion when we thought about the agony that Christ, you know, went through. I'm not saying like, you know, you're you're sad. I mean, I mean if if you're sad and if you think about the suffering, you know, moves you, makes you emotional that you're that you're wrong or that you're wicked or something like that. Uh, it should be normal. In fact, Jesus, you know, when Lazarus, uh, when, when he went to go see Lazarus, it says Jesus wept, that popular verse in uh, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. But quite honestly, I believe he wept for a different reason than what you typically think. You think, oh, well, he, he loved Lazarus. That's what the people were saying. He loved Lazarus so much, that's why he's weeping. Well, he also told his disciples, he, sleep, he sleepeth, right? He knew he was going to go. He knew he was going to raise him up from the dead. You know, Martha, Lazarus' sister is like, had you been here, he would have risen from the dead. And, and, and of course, he says, I know he'll, he'll be in the resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. The, I am the resurrection and the life, right? He that would, he, help me out. Somebody. <laughs> he that were dead, what? He that, believe, he that believeth in me, thank you, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm mixing up a couple different verses there. But you see, he was saying, look, the hope is in the resurrection. The hope is in, you know, the power of Christ and why it is he had to die. Now, I might be making too big of a deal out of that, but I want, I want you to understand that today's Christianity is all about the suffering and the agony and all we got to do. You know, I was just doing a lot of study because in Sunday school, and I wish I had time to go over some of these things, but I won't. But in Sunday school, we talked about the... Uh, the Catholic view of what we call the Lord's Supper. And the Catholicism really has not only messed up so much Christian theology, but it's, it's actually impacted even Baptist churches today. And a lot of what we do, we've, it's, we t- we've taken a hi- historical and traditional uh, approach that's been passed down. So, no, 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 it's not from the Catholics, it's from the Reformation. Well, guess what? The Reformation was influenced by Catholicism, okay? So a lot of the practices have been passed down. And uh, and if we're not careful, we start thinking that we need to be like that. And we we think that we need to uh, 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 do these things that they did. Now, I do believe that we have basically two... Okay, so real quickly, I don't have time to go through the the Sunday school lesson I preached this morning, but we do have what I would call two ordinances, okay? Now, some would say, no, there's more than that. All right, historically, here's where Catholicism has kind of like messed up our view on this. Catholicism has what's called sacraments, all right? And they believe in, I think, seven sacraments. And, uh, and so what happened, when Martin Luther came around, Martin Luther said, no, this is not right. This is too much emphasis on work. And, and salvation's through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not through works. And so he limited them down to two sacraments, <laughs> okay? He still put emphasis on the grace of God through baptism. You read his writings, and you want to believe Luther was saved. You want to believe, man, he's a good guy. He's got, he says a lot of good things. But, boy, he sure put emphasis on baptism for salvation, baptism or regeneration. And then the other thing was the Eucharist. Okay, the Eucharist is what we call the Lord's Supper. The Catholics call the Eucharist, where they literally believe that that bread or that little wafer that they take turns into the body of Christ, and they call it the host. And it's like they they treat it like it's it's you know it is Jesus in the other room in the box. And uh, and 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 what I was studying about this, if you don't believe in transubstantiation, you're not supposed to be allowed to take the the Eucharist. At the Catholic Church. Now, now, ironically, a, a, a poll shows that only 30% of Catholics themselves even believe in transubstantiation. So that means the majority of the people that are taking that, they're not even actually qualified by, by Catholic standards. And by the way, if you're not, if you're not Catholic, right? If you've not been baptized and gone through all the sacraments, whatever, and consider yourself Catholic. You're not supposed to even take the, the, the Eucharist if, you know, in, the, in the Catholic Church. Now, I find that kind of funny because a lot of Baptists are, are, are all about like open communion and just let anybody come or whatever. And I'm thinking that even the Catholics are, are like, if you're not Catholic, you, know, you can't take, a, 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 take the, the Eucharist, right? So why did, how did I get off on that? Okay, because I believe that Christians do have, we do have from the Bible, Jesus left us with two 
some will call them ordinances. I would say more like this, memorial services, okay? Two pictures, memorial uh, uh, practices that the church is supposed to do that Jesus himself uh, initiated that we're supposed to do. And these are basically reflective practices, okay? So, so the, we're talking about the reflect, reflecting on his suffering, okay? Well, there's, if, if we look at all the things Jesus said, all the, the examples we have in the Bible, well, when are we supposed to actually reflect on the suffering of Jesus Christ? The closest you're going to get are these two ordinances or these two memorial services that are practiced by churches today, okay? Number one is baptism. Look at Romans chapter 6. We were supposed to have a baptism today, so I was going to try to kill two birds with one stone and talk about baptism and the Lord's Supper, but that's okay. This is still, still applies to all of us. Look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I've preached on baptism. A couple other guys have preached on baptism as well, and I'm not going to labor on that so much, except to say uh, that the Bible does talk about baptism being a picture, okay? Baptism being sim symbolic of what salvation is. So when we get saved, we're actually in Christ. We're baptized in Christ. We're baptized in the Spirit, okay? Uh, there's another denomination out there that believes baptism in the Spirit means you're going to speak in tongues and you're going to do all this kind of stuff. No, that's not what it means. It just means that you're immersed in Christ. You're in Christ, and He's in you, and, 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 and you're saved, okay? You're, you're born of the Spirit, all right? And so when that, when that happens, uh, you know, there's no physical evidence about that. But when we baptize somebody in the water, we're, we're doing something that's symbolic of that baptism in Christ. So we take them under the water. Hey, you're buried with Christ. And then you're raised, uh, you know, in new life, like as Christ was raised up again. This is all a picture. And Romans 6 uh, gives a good uh, example of that. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Now, remember I was saying it's not just the suffering of Christ on the cross like so much of mainstream Christianity wants to make it. And I'm not saying they don't focus on the resurrection. I realize every Christian, anyone that calls themselves Christian is going to talk about the resurrection. But their focus seems to be on the suffering and being sad and being, you know, just mourning about that kind of stuff. I don't even know what the practice is exactly, but I guess uh, this time of year, uh, Ash Wednesday must have already, or would that be this coming Wednesday? Is that Ash Wednesday? Does anybody know? Yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> and, then, and I remember working somewhere uh, where the guy came in, my boss came in and he had something on his head. I was like, hey man, you got a little dirt or something right there. And he's like, no, it's not dirt. It's, ash, it's ashes. And I was like, oh, why? Why do you have ashes on your phone? <laughs> he's like, it's Ash Wednesday. No idea what he was talking about at the time. All right. But there's just like this, this focus on that. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. Okay. But look at 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Definitely Ash Wednesday is not in the Bible. Yep. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So when we preach the gospel, we're preaching... The, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, right? Uh, probably most people in here, if you're leading somebody to the Lord, you're going to stop by at some point, uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10, right? And you're going you're gonna to talk about uh, with the uh, uh, mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Uh, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, is, uh, confession is made unto salvation. But what does it say there? It says, let's look at it right there. It's not far back. Romans 10, 9, and 10. that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that Jesus died on the cross 
That's not even what it says, does it? Believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead. See, it's the whole thing. It's the whole package. He died. He buried. He rose again. Hey, when we are in Christ, we are the old man is buried with him, and then we live in the new man, right? Going to raise up again in the last day, just like Christ rose up. He's first fruits. And uh, this is the whole gospel that we preach. Aren't you glad when I take somebody into the baptistry, I don't just just bury them with Christ because Christ was buried and they just leave them under the water. For the <laughs> they got to come back up, right? And this is, a, this is part of the gospel and this is part of the picture that we show. So you say one of the reflective moments is baptism. It's, the one, it's, it's one of the ordinances. Most Baptists would just say the two ordinances. And so they would say, you know, hey, this is to commemorate that. Well, yeah, it's the death, the burial, the resurrection. Okay? And then the second memorial that we have is the Lord's Supper. Now, this we get to uh, take part in here this week. And really, there's very limited uh, examples in the Bible of this. Now, baptism, there's actually quite a bit in the New Testament. Uh, the, uh, there's very limited examples of this. First of all would obviously be the Last Supper where Jesus is up in the upper room with the disciples and they take the Last Supper and he says, do this in remembrance of me and, uh, and sets this, this example. Now, this morning, again, I, I wish I had time to go over some of this, uh, uh, some more of this with you, but when I'm studying out what the, the Catholic Church does with the Eucharist and everything at, their, at their, the Mass, I guess the right way to say it would be that they have a mass service in which they take the Eucharist, but I think those words are kind of interchangeable. But there are several things that they're supposed to do. Like they're, they're supposed to, uh, first of all, confess their sins and, uh, and repent of them or whatever. Then they're supposed to fast. Like, it, like I read it said like up to an hour or at least an hour before they take the Eucharist, they're supposed to fast because there's supposed to be a time of, of reflection and suffering and all that kind of stuff. Which I found a little interesting because at the Last Supper, what did they do right before they broke the bread? They ate the Passover lamb. <laughs> there wasn't any fasting going on, right? And then he, he, he ate and he took that. And, and so let's, let, let's look at uh, the main verse that we have on the practice of the Lord's Supper. Again, we had the Last Supper that Jesus did, but then if, if we never saw that again in the Bible, we might say, maybe that was just a one-time deal with his disciples. I know he said, as oft as you do this, do it in remember, remembrance of me. But if we didn't see it anywhere else in the Bible, we might be, you know, we might wonder about that. But we do have 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you'll notice this. I want to make this point not, not super important, but I want to make this point clear. When Jesus had that Last Supper, he had a pretty specific crowd with him, didn't he? I mean, the 12 disciples, 11 if you don't count Judas, but they were there in the upper room. This was that first church, if you will. There were other disciples, I realize, but these were the ones that followed Christ everywhere, and these were the only ones, you know. Now, there was a feeding of the 5,000, I understand, on the hill and all that kind of stuff, but that wasn't the uh, Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was done in this upper room in a private gathering, a select group of people, okay? Now, when uh, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and he's talking about the Lord's Supper, he's talking to a specific group of people, this church that exists in Corinth, okay? And so here's why I say, again, it's not super important. I'm not going to divide fellowship with, it, with anybody over this. I don't think it's necessary. Okay, but there are a lot of people out there that are offended by the practice of what we call closed communion. All right, closed communion means, hey, this is like a members-only thing. It's not for outsiders. It's not just for everyone who calls themselves a Baptist to come in and have the Lord's Supper. We believe that it's something that should be governance by, uh, governed by the local body. All right. And this is the best way I can explain this. So I always try to bring it back to this. All right. My sister and I, uh, you know, we're brother, sister, no matter what. Okay. However, she lives in a different house than I do. And if I go to her house, we do it, we do it her way. If she comes to my house, we do it, we do it our way. Okay. And so if you go to another church and they say, Hey, we, we have closed communion right here, you know. Uh, if you're going to take communion, just take you have to take communion with your church body. Why somebody would get offended by that, I don't understand. 
but there are people. We've had we've had several people in Iola over the years, no, nobody recently, who stopped coming to church and said, I won't ever go to that church again because they practice closed communion and they thought that was like an abomination or something like that because you refuse people to take the Lord's Supper. Well, guess what? It's not the Eucharist. <laughs> Your salvation is not dependent on it. It's a practice that we do in the church, you know, and, uh, and so th- we have certain ways uh, that we wish that we want to do it. And we have certain reasons for not wanting to just open it up to anybody that, uh, that comes in. So here's what he says to the church of Corinth. Look at verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he had betrayed, he was betrayed, sorry, took bread. Now, first of all, let me say this. He, Paul is saying this, you know, this is what I was taught. This is what was passed down to me from Jesus. And now I'm going to teach that to you. Isn't that part of the Great Commission as well? I mean, the Great Commission, what? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? We're preaching the gospel. We're seeing souls saved. And then it says, you know, baptize, uh, baptize them, name the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. And then what? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Uh, this is the threefold commission that's given to, to the church. All right. And so Paul, you know, is obviously doing all those things. And one of the things they did was, hey, this is an, an ordinance that I'm going to pass on to you. And he said that, uh, I lost my place here. Okay. He said, uh, verse 18. Nope, that's too far. Okay. So I started too, I started too far down. We need to come back up. Okay. Uh, verse 17. Now in, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for better, but for worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifested among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before another his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunkard. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have, uh, have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Okay. Now, just to s- summarize real quickly, basically the main thing that he's getting on to them about right now is that there's divisions. You know, this is one church body. They're not supposed to be divided, but they're divided. And when it comes to taking the Lord's Supper, uh, they're just, he's not praising them because what they're doing is wrong. The way that they're doing it is wrong, okay? And then he begins to explain what the what is like to take the Lord's Supper. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was uh, betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it. And said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of, of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that blood and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned uh, with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry uh, one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come." Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I've struggled with the Lord's Supper most of my life. And even as a pastor, I've questioned some of my, my thinking on that and some of the, the teachings that I've been taught historically. And I'm going to tell you this. I believe some of my confusion has been because of Catholic teaching and being passed on and all this. 
Now, there's a mystery here. This whole examining yourself and all that, and, and some eat unworthily, and some drink damnation, is a little bit of a mystery, but I'm going to tell you this. There's only one way to be unworthy of drinking of that cup, and that is to not actually be saved to begin with. Ironically, all the Catholics that are taking this, and they believe that if you don't drink this, and if you don't drink it worthily, meaning that you're not Catholic, or you don't believe in transubstantiation, or something like that, then you're going to go to hell. They actually believe that's a, a, a mortal sin, and if you do that, if you do the Lord's Supper wrong, what they call the Eucharist, that you would actually go to hell, unless you go to the priest and ask forgiveness and all that stuff. It's bizarre, bizarre. But the thing is that none of them are saved if they're trusting in their works and the seven sacraments and all this stuff to be saved. And so they are drinking and eating unworthily. Okay? The only way that you can take that and say it's you're, you're, you're worthy to take it, right, is if you're saved because you have actually received Jesus Christ, which is what the whole taking the bread and the, and the wine is all about. You know, the, uh, they go to John 6. We won't take the time to go there, but they go to John 6 to say that the, uh, the blood, I mean, the body literally becomes, that bread literally becomes the body of Jesus Christ because he talks about eating my flesh, all right? But if you read that, it's so clear. You know what? We got to go there, okay? So uh, uh, let's look at John 6. It's not in my notes, so this could be dangerous, but <laughs> let's go to John 6. Now, First of all, first of all, look at verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's pretty simple, don't you think? <laughs> That's pretty easy to understand. So what's following this is going to be symbolic of what he just explained. I am the bread of life. Then he begins to talk about the manna, right? The bread of heaven that came down. And he says in verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Now, wait a minute. He just said, if you believe on me, you have everlasting life. And now he's saying, if you eat my body and drink my blood. Guess what? It means the same thing. <laughs> it's a picture of receiving Jesus Christ. He's saying, you eat it. You're right? Is he, Jesus was just using pictures. There's a lot of times the Bible talks like that, like some of the prophets were told to eat a scroll, you know what I mean? And it symbolized just like taking it in and, uh, and digesting it and understanding, you know, uh, Jesus used pictures like that all the time. When he talks about the, the resurrection or the, in the return of Christ, he says that where the, where the uh, carcass is, the eagles shall be gathered right? They're not literally going to come in the rapture and eat Jesus's flesh, okay? He's just saying that, hey, just like the eagles are gathered to the carcass or the buzzards or whatever uh, the, the word eagles is, is re referring to there, uh, then, then, you know, he's using that as a picture, just like that. When Jesus comes, all the, all the Christians, will, you know, he's not really going to eat his, eat his flesh, okay? So, uh, so the, the, obviously, I don't have to convince anybody in here, but the Catholics got that all, all messed up. But he makes it very clear that he's, this is a picture of believing. Whosoever believeth, you know, has everlasting life. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so my confusion in many ways has been, what do we do during a Lord's Supper service? Last year, I tried it. Uh, I had several reasons. It was when we first were finding out that Valerie was uh, expecting and we didn't know and she was real sick and she was out in the car and I remember being real uh, like scatterbrained during the service. But I remember feeling like that was the most awkward service we've ever had. But quite honestly, we were talking about this on the way up here, every Lord's Supper seems awkward to me. <laughs> Right? It seems awkward because there's so many of these traditions that they do. And they get up there, and then the, the deacon has to do first, and he serves so-and-so, and then they serve so-and-so. And, and they've got this plate that if you look up the Roman Catholic Eucharist, it looks exactly like what we have on our, this do in remembrance of me. And there's this little gold plates. They're not really gold, but... And you hold we used to be. I threw those away when I became the pastor because they looked too Catholic to me. But these circular little wafers... Right. And then you pass those out and you take that. And I'm like, the whole ritual thing seems silly to me. It seems kind of weird. And then afterwards it was like, OK, now there's going to be a time of reflection. And so you're going to think about that. And oh, you better not take it unworthily. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times when I was a teenager I didn't take it because I was afraid if I took the Lord's Supper 
and there was sin in my life that I hadn't confessed. There were people in the church that were going to get sick, maybe even die, <laughs> because I did, took it unworthily. And I was just afraid. I didn't know what to do that. Well, what to do about that? And I'm telling you, most of that I believe comes from the influence of Catholicism and 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 this teaching. Now I'm a little bit still confused on some of that, and I'm still trying to figure out where I fall on some of the uh, some of that concept and what exactly you're supposed to do. <clears throat> Traditionally, since I was a little kid, we always ended the service by singing a hymn. And then leaving because that's what they did in the upper room. Jesus, you know, they they sang in him and they left. It doesn't say what they did after they left, but I was always taught, no, you better not socialize and fellowship afterwards, man. Just sing the song and then leave. And I'm telling you, that's the most awkward thing. Whenever you're a Baptist and you like to fellowship and all that kind of stuff, it's awkward. So I'm still trying to think through that kind of stuff, and hopefully I'll grow and and understand some things a little bit better. But I'm telling you this: the reflecting shouldn't be on the fact that oh. You know, how terrible it is that he suffered. Oh, how, you know, how hard of a life we ought to live as Christians. And, you know, get this Catholic mentality that we've got to like beat ourselves and crawl on our knees on broken glass and carry a literal cross on our back and, and all this kind of stuff. No, 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 no. You're missing it. You're missing it. If you think that's what it means to reflect on the suffering of Christ. Jesus had to suffer, but guess what? He's not on the cross anymore. He rose again. And now he's got a work for us to do. I'm glad. Let me show you a few things, a few other things about the Lord's Supper. Now, again, I there's different churches do it different ways. Um, they're welcome to do it. That's their their congregation. Okay, their their each church should be independent. Okay, and autonomous. But uh, here's how we do it, and I and and I'll tell you why I think it's I think it's good. We only take Lord's Supper one time a year. Is it wrong to take it more than that? No. We don't know how long, how many times you're supposed to take it. All we know is the Bible says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. We don't know how many times to take it. I know some Baptist churches that take it every Sunday. I personally think that would be overkill, all right? Because here's what happens. All, you're, you're, you're becoming kind of like the Catholic. This Every time you meet, it's for Mass, so that you take the Eucharist and you think about the suffering, and you go through these rituals, and they've got... I downloaded a 75-page order of services for the Eucharist. No, I didn't read it all, and I don't plan on it, but I'm just saying I got it 75 pages. And, and, uh, and I looked through, and there's all these like ritualistic things they do. Uh, it said like the priest uh, you know, kisses the altar, and that's like blesses the, the Eucharist. Maybe that's when it becomes Jesus' body to them. I don't know. And I thought, well, this is weird. Surely not, because you know, if you download an order of service for a Baptist uh, service, you're going to get 1,000 different orders of services, okay? They're always different. Now a lot of them kind of build off of each other, whatever. But I said, surely not every mass has this exact script. And so I looked up this guy that I go to a little bit for reference on what the Catholics believe so that when I'm knocking on doors and I talk to a Catholic, I'm not saying stupid things and they're like, that's not what we believe. And so I listened to this guy and I watched him. Because of the time of the year it is, you know, they're really big on these special kind of uh, mass services that they have and leading up to uh, to the advent. Sure enough, the guy comes out in his silly clothes. He bends over and he kisses the uh, the altar. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Exactly what was on that script. There's a reading. There's a certain prayer that they do. There's all these kinds of things. And I'm like, you know what? If we as Baptists become ritualistic like that and ceremonial and everything represents this and does that. But I think we're missing the whole point about what we're supposed to be doing when we come together as the body of Christ and we fellowship and we encourage one another's, uh, another and we tarry one for another and, and all these things that they're saying. So I'm glad that we do it once a year because it seems to me like, like that is a good, you know, and it, it just, I love the way the, the seasons work out where you got uh, Christmas and, and you got Easter at the time that Easter comes. Well, guess what? We do the Lord's Supper right around Passover time. I'm not saying that we take it during Passover because that changes a little bit, but we take it right around Passover time, which I think is perfect because when Jesus, uh, when with his disciples, went up into that upper room and when Jesus administered the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, it was during the Passover feast, right? And I think that's instrumental because I think what he was doing is saying, I am the Passover lamb. I just saw a Baptist missionary, not one that we support, but a Baptist missionary just posted something on Facebook and it's like got the Star of David 
or rim fram or whatever you want to call it. And, and, uh, and he's got this on there and it says, happy Passover. And I've heard of Baptist churches that sit down and take the Passover and they're like, oh, this represents this and that and that. And I'm like, I think that's like borderline, at least borderline blasphemy because the Passover has already been fulfilled. Jesus was the Passover and he fulfilled that. Now he instituted a new practice, which was the Lord's Supper. And this is how we commemorate uh, I don't think we have to take the Passover, but I do think we should take the, the Lord's Supper. Okay, it's not part of our salvation or anything like that. Obviously, it's just something that we should do uh, as, we, as we practice. I like to do it once a year. I don't have any problem with people that do it more than once a year. I guess I'll actually be doing it twice, twice uh, this year. <laughs> one on Friday, one on Saturday. It also happens right before Easter, which is so cool because... You're not just dwelling on the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ, but you're saying, you know what? Right around the corner, we're, suffer we're, we're, we're uh, uh, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he didn't stay on the cross. It didn't, he didn't just die and we go around weeping like the disciples on the road to, Ar uh, to Ar uh, uh, what is it called? The Emmaus, thank you. And uh, we're not just like on the road to Emmaus and just weeping and crying and Jesus is like, you fools, <laughs> you know? Don't you know that the, Jesus ought to have suffered these things? Look at uh, Acts chapter 1. I'm just about done. Pretty much am done. Acts chapter 1. Now there's two... There's two extremes in Christianity. Okay, one extreme is they spend all their time reflecting on the past. Jesus suffering. Jesus died on the cross. Oh, agony, suffering, tears, crying, all that kind of stuff. Then there's another extreme in, in mainstream Christianity, which is just waiting for the return of Christ. Just looking up in the clouds. He's going to come back any moment. And there's just like no labor, no living for the Lord, no working for the Lord. It's just like, hey, I don't have to worry about persecution or anything like that because that's the wrath of God. And I'm out of here when, before any of that happens. You won't see that anywhere in the Bible. The Bible talks about tribulation. Even if you don't want to believe in the great tribulation, there's going to be tribulation if you're a Christian. And if you live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. All these things, we've got a job to do. We don't just sit with our head in the clouds. Well, when's he coming back? I'm going to do rapture practice. And, you know, I grew up where the, the entire service is just like, hey, he's coming any moment and all this kind of stuff. And, and just wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we reflecting on? <laughs> it's almost like Jesus is saying, you know, hey, don't weep for me. Don't spend all your time thinking about my suffering. Think about why I suffered, you know, but don't think about. And don't spend all your time looking in the clouds. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Or uh, I guess I got to back up. Verse 10, And while they looked, this is after the resurrection, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by, with, uh, uh, with them, by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. You can read in, into chapter 2 and all the evangelism that went on from that time forward. The church began to do what it was supposed to do. And, uh, and here's the idea. Don't look at the past, right? That's, that's the past. It's over. Don't look at, I mean, we, we can remember the past, obviously, learn from it and think about it and dwell on why Jesus died. And there's, there's, that's good. Don't focus on the future. Well, what's going to happen next? When's he coming around? You're living in the present. You're living in the present and you've got a job to do. What's that job? Well, you go and you preach the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the hope of Jesus Christ for eternal life. Those who believe in him have everlasting life. Uh, but, but, you know, so many people in mainstream Christianity want to make it so much more difficult than that. So reflecting on his suffering, well, sure, we think about what Jesus did for us. It might bring some sadness when you think, man, he really had to suffer for us, right? But that's not where our focus really is. Our focus is on the power of the gospel, why he did it, the life that it brings, and the job that he's given us to do in spreading that to the lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for this time of year. Uh, just 
uh, as I said at the beginning of the service, just the, the thought of new life in the springtime and, and, uh, and everything just kind of leads up to thinking about uh, the death, burial, and, and then the resurrection and the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, I thank you for that hope. And uh, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain, Lord. So I pray that you'll help us to remember to preach uh, the gospel and help us to focus on uh, why we're here and what we're supposed to do. Bless this church, Lord. I thank you so much for the effort of reaching souls, and I pray you bless that. And certainly we know we're laying up treasures in heaven, and so I pray that you will help us not get weary, continue to send laborers, and continue to give the strength and the boldness to do the work you call us to do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.